Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to show you how people have had different ideas through history about the tribulation and different ideas through history about the Antichrist. Now, bring it up to this point of time. Bring it up to more uh, to the 20th century. World War II with Germany and Hitler. Now, this really gets bizarre. I have some very, very old books from the 20s and 30s in my library in which they declare unequivocally Hitler is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. Now, had you been, how, was anybody living in the 30s? During the Depression, you were a child. I know Beverly was. Is anybody else living in the 30s? Y'all don't want to raise your hand. Go ahead and raise your hand. If you got, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Let me see. Let me see again. You were living back in that time. You were a child back in that time. Now, maybe you'll remember preachers back in that day, if you were Christians, mentioning this. Let's go over why they thought Hitler was the Antichrist. Here we go. Number one, President Roosevelt had is issued a Social Security number, and everybody had a number that they had to take. And you know the beast is going to give everybody a number. Therefore, Roosevelt was connected to this. There were three frogs that come out of the mouth of the false prophet and the beast and his kingdom. Those three frogs were, I have a book that says this, Nazism, Communism, and Fascism. There's your three, frog, three spirits that came out of the mouth of fascism, communism, Nazism. Okay. Now, there was a satanic trinity being taught. The beast were the Nazi armies. The false prophet was Mussolini because he was from Italy. <laughs> and the Antichrist was Hitler himself. Now, Mussolini goes into northern Africa and starts taking over Libya, Ethiopia, and Egypt and, and, and having wars in that area. Well, that's in Daniel chapter 11, verse 45, that the Antichrist takes over those three areas. Mussolini went into an agreement with Hitler... So everybody was saying, now, now the false prophet has now aligned himself with the Antichrist. Hitler then had money that was no good. Remember, there was hyperinflation. He just pulled, he pulled the German money out and reprinted a new money, the German mark, mark of the beast. Everybody with me? Say yes. Hitler had an emblem that represented his kingdom called the swastika. He was called the Third Reich. His swastika was on everything, armbands, flags, everything they could find. The biggest thing was this. He then began to put uh, tattoos on the arms of Jews. Every Jew had, was given a number on their arm, and those Jews died, died with numbers on their arms, and six million Jews were slaughtered. So here's a big one. From 1939, uh, uh, where they started attacking the Jewish people, to 1945, when it was all over, seven years now, if you talk to some Jewish rabbis, not Messianic, but Jewish rabbis, and you ask them and you say, what about the future tribulation mentioned in Daniel? They will say, Hitler fulfilled the tribulation in Daniel. They will say it was seven years in length. Daniel's last week is seven years. And God then reestablished Israel at the end of those seven years. So they make Daniel 9, 27, the fulfillment of the Holocaust, saying now everlasting righteousness has come because Israel will never be destroyed again and we're a nation again. Now, the only thing with that, I'm going to give you a nugget here that's not in my notes, is if you go back and remember that the Bible calls the tribulation Jacob's trouble. Remember that first. There will be a time of trouble. Jacob's trouble. What was Jacob's trouble? Ready? Jacob wanted to marry a woman and work seven years and got the wrong one. And then his father-in-law Laban said, you have to fulfill her week to get the one you want. Fulfill her week. The word week is the same Hebrew word used in Daniel 9.27 where it says that Antichrist confirms covenant for one week. And how long did he have to work? Seven days? No. Seven years. Don't miss this. Jacob had two periods of seven. One seven where he didn't really get what he wanted. He got a wife that produced some children, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the one he wanted. He had to work seven more years to get the one he wanted. So there's two periods of times, in my opinion, of seven years connected to Israel. Ready? The first one was the Holocaust created by Hitler for seven years, and the next one is the Antichrist, which is seven years. That's why Jacob's trouble is two periods of seven and not one period of seven. I'll just say, I'll just say this, not trying to be carnal here, but just being, a, just being a fella. Look, anybody that would work for a woman for 14 years to get her, I want to see what she looks like in a glorified body in heaven. 
I mean, you just think, no, let's not, let's not think about that. Let's stay, <laughs> stay right here in the Word where we need to stay. All right. Now, having said that, let me show you this again. So we do have, we do have some periods of time, time in history in which there have been people who have thought that we are in the tribulation period or people that have thought that somehow we're on the edge of it in the Antichrist. Early church did it. Reformers did it. They did it in the time of Hitler. Now, let me ask ourselves this question, which is very, very, very important, and that is this. Going back to the seals, is there any way I could prove to someone that we're not in those seals yet? And I think what you have to do, this is what you have to do. You cannot pick and choose a scripture to make one part of that scripture fit and the other's not yet fitting. It has to all fit or it don't fit. Look, if you have an eight foot, seven isn't going to fit. It might be the shoe you want, but put, you can put part of your foot in it, but you can't put all of it in it. Now let's look at this. Here we go. Let's go back to the seal's explanation. First of all is the fourth seal, which is the green horse. Now if we look at the fourth seal from the book of Revelation, when this green horse appears, the pale green horse, it kills one-fourth of the population on the earth. Now, we know that hundreds of thousands of people have died in the Middle East. Syria, there's been a couple hundred thousand people die there. With ISIS and all these other groups, people are dying. However, as of today, if the horse were loose, it means that one, listen to this now, that one-fourth of the population would be 1.75 billion people, not tens of thousands. So when this horse comes, 1.75 billion have to die. That has not happened anywhere in the world. You can't even combine the numbers of wars to come out since the Civil War till now, anything close to a number like that. So they have to die by sword, which is war, by hunger, which is famine, beasts of the field, which in my opinion are diseases that are released through animals. You know, we got bird flu over here. You got mad cow disease. And to me, it's diseases released through animals. And it kills 25% of the world's population. Here's what I say about the green horse thing. And it's real. That picture's real. No doubt about that. With that pale green horse in Egypt. But I say it's a sign and not a seal. Mm, that's a message. It's a sign. It's just a sign. It's all it is, not the seal. All right? Now, the fifth seal is the martyrs and beheadings. Now, when ISIS began to do this, again, these are good men, by the way. I have no argument with their character, their life with God, how serving God. Maybe their interpretation is just different than ours. But when these men begin to say ISIS is killing people, this is in book of Revelation. The Lamb has released the seal in heaven, and these are the tribulation martyrs, and we're now in the middle of the tribulation period. Well, it's, just, it's not like beheadings have not taken place before. In the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which controlled from 1894 to 1915, a certain part of the world, 20, let's see, 35 total providences in three continents. Here's something. They, they begin to enact genocide against Armenian Christians. Now check this out. Check this number out. This is a moderate number. The Turks killed in Armenia 1.5 million Christians. You don't hear about this much in history, but it happened. They killed 4,000 priests and bishops. Christians were tortured, crucified, and beheaded in such untold numbers that blood was just running in the street. So my point is, if you start in 66 A.D. where Paul and Peter were both beheaded uh, in Rome, and you go from 66 A.D. to 1915, the peak of the Turkish uh, genocide time, you will discover that there have been millions of people beheaded by the sword in the name of the Lord and there were Christians. Now, again, I will say the reason in Revelation 6, you see a multitude in heaven that's on top of the throne of God in chapters 4 and 5, worshiping the Lamb and saying, you have redeemed us out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Then you see a group under the altar. Martyrs go to a very special place. Now, all the martyrs up till this point, when Jesus comes back, every martyr up to the moment the trump of God sounds in 1 Thessalonians 4 will be resurrected, brought out of that place, and rule with us and be in heaven standing with us immediately. The martyrs of chapter 6 are tribulation martyrs who have to give up their life for, because they know what is happening. And when Islam begins to sweep the world at that time, anybody that says, I'm not your religion and I'm not following you, we're gonna, they're going to they're gonna face death just like ISIS does today. So the, there are martyrs now, but there will be martyrs in the future. And so I go back to this and say this to you. The numbers that you see of a multitude that can't even be numbered of martyrs 
are the ones who are in heaven now from Rome all the way to now. But when they are resurrected, it empties out that part of paradise. And then in Revelation 6, when tribulation does begin, people are going to be martyred for a testimony because they're not going to follow the religion of the beast. They're not going to follow the system that's going to be developed. And they are going to be a blessed people willing to give up their life. Now, I want to say something to you. This is real important. When you talk about the willingness to be beheaded for the gospel, there are a lot of people that will say something like this. Well, Brother Perry, boy, if I don't make it, you know, if I don't make it, I'll just put my head down. Let me say something to you. You can't make it when there's Christian TV. You can't make it when there's conferences. You can't make it when half the town goes to church. You can't make it when you got a Bible that you can read. You can't make it when your electricity is on. You can't make it when you got food to eat. You can't make it when you got money in your pocket. And you actually think you're going to be willing to lay down your life and you can't make it when it's all going good. Come on, help me preach it. I mean, don't, don't, even, don't even think that way. Because if you, hey, listen here, if you don't have the strength to stand for the Lord when somebody calls you a holy roller, and you don't have the strength to stand for the Lord when somebody mocks you because you trust Jesus, there is no way when the Spirit of God in the church body has been lifted to heaven and there's a limited anointing working through two witnesses and a group of Jewish men on the earth, you, there's no way that you're going to have the ability or the gumption to stand up the way you think you're going to be able to stand up. It's totally, totally different. Because you've got some people, man, they buckle to the least bit of peer pressure. Hey, hey. All right. So the beheadings taking place are not the beheading levels or whatever required in the seal of the fifth seal. Now, in the blood moons, because now that's an interesting verse because it does say the sun's dark and the moon turned to blood. Now, we know the sun darkened in Judaism is a solar eclipse and the moon to blood is lunar eclipses. And most of you now have heard the teaching. If you haven't, you're really late and behind. <laughs> But most of you know the four blood moons and they fell on Passover tabernacles, Passover tabernacles, back-to-back -back years. It is a sign, no doubt about it. Don't you dare let anybody talk you into it that this is just some kind of freak thing and preachers are, are building this up. It's not true. It's a sign. However, the sun being dark and the moon turning into blood can also, in the book of Rev Revelation, allude to explosions taking place, the opening of the abyss in which all this dust gets into the atmosphere. A meteorite hitting can do it. It darkens the sun for a period of time and even when the Gulf War broke out and they were burning the oil fields uh, the sun was darkened in certain areas and the chemicals from the oil actually made the moon look blood red and I thought that was very interesting the moon even had a weird it wasn't white it was a really weird color because of chemicals it didn't happen everywhere but in certain areas depending on where you were it just kind of had a weird effect to it at times all right now go back to the, the seal and let's see what the Bible says about all of this that has to happen when the seals broken here we go there has to be a court According to the Bible, when the sun's darkened and the moon becomes blood, there has to be an earthquake, an earthquake coinciding with the blood moon. And someone said, wait a minute, they just had an earthquake up in Nepal. That's a horrible earthquake. 7.8, which is the biggest earthquake since 1900. I don't know if you've seen that on the news. Buildings have collapsed. I mean, entire roads are split right down the middle. It's going to take them years to repair this. I don't even know how they're going to repair uh, up Nepal, which is in up, up at the border of northern India. All right. Now, Having said that, if you read, you have to have a massive earthquake that's so bad that every island and mountain is moved out of its place. There's not been an earthquake yet where it, uh, it coincided. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it, could there not be one happen maybe by the next blood moon? Who knows? But there's not been an earthquake yet where the entire world shook to where every island, this is what it says, every island is moved and even islands start disappearing. When this happens so going back to this it also says the stars will fall from heaven stars plural now there was this kind of an asteroid kind of thing that hit in russia you remember some time back and they're spotting asteroids in the sky now 10 that are very dangerous down the road that could hit the could could be pulled into the gravitational pull of the earth not that they're directly supposed to hit earth but the gravitational keyholes and all these type of things and the gravitational of other planets and pulling them in could change their course all right having said that watch three things sun darkened moon blood massive earthquake every island and mountain is moved stars fall from heaven the point is when that seals broken this happens all at once 
all at once. There's never been a time up to this point that you can, you can find an earthquake here, an earthquake there, a meteorite there, an asteroid there, an earthquake on an island, an earthquake there. You can find where it's been a few blood moons on feast days. You have nowhere yet where it's all happened at once. So watch this. You can't, oh yes, go ahead, Perry, and preach. Thank you. You can't pick and choose the scripture and do a news exit Jesus from one part of it and leave the other part out. All right? And, and I'm not saying people do this purposely. I really am not. I don't think they do it purposely. But I think some people get very excited about what they see and they try to make, maybe force a fulfillment when it's not yet the fulfillment. So that brings me to this question. How do we know? How will we know if we're here that the tribulation either is about to begin or has begun. Now, I'm going to give you some other reasons why there is no way possible we're even in the tribulation period. Anybody want to hear this? Yes. Let me try that again. I'm going to give you in a moment, I'm going to give you right now the reasons I absolutely can prove from the Bible that we are not in the tribulation. Anybody want to hear this right now? Yes. Ready? This is a big point. Point number one. There has to be 10 kings organized in one unit before the Antichrist can even rise to power. The Antichrist does not form 10 kings. The Antichrist takes over 10 kings. Daniel 4.22, the 10 toes on the image are 10 nations. Daniel 7 and 7, the 10 horns on the beast are 10 kings. Now, this is all speaking of the same thing, the future. Revelation 13, verse 1, the ten horns on the beast are ten kings. Revelation 17, 12, the ten horns, and this again is a beast, a non-descriptive beast that John sees, are ten kings that will burn the harlot with fire. Now, I want you to pay careful attention to when Daniel saw these ten, what else he saw, and this is Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. The ten kings, I'm sorry, the ten horns are ten kings which shall arise after this kingdom. This kingdom being the, the, the empires of Bible prophecies from the past. And another shall arise after them. He will be different from the first ones and he will subdue or uproot three kings. When you go into the book of Daniel, you later discover who... The three of the ten are that the Antichrist pulls up, and they are in Daniel 11, 45, 46, Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia. How odd, how odd that there was an uprising in Egypt and their leader, uh, Mubarak, was removed. How odd that there was an uprising in Libya and Gaddafi, who'd been there for years, was shot and killed by his own people and removed. How odd that Egypt, they've stabilized recently, thank God for that, but still has uprisings and problems internally, economic problems. How odd that Libya has three tribal groups fighting for power and for the oil. How odd that Ethiopia, which was one time a total Christian nation, has now become predominantly Muslim. How odd that Egypt, Libya, and Ethiopia is predominantly Muslim, although there were 10 million Coptic Christians living in Egypt. My point is this. When Egypt started having their Arab Spring, as they called it, and their uprisings, I called some of my office staff and I said, if we're really in the last days, Libya has to be next. They have to fall. And they fell. And I said, now watch Ethiopia. Because you're going to see, and if you keep an eye on Ethiopia, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and these other groups are trying to move into Ethiopia. Here's my point. According to the scripture, these 10 kings are in power when the Antichrist takes over. How do I know that? Revelation 17 and 12. And these horns are 10 kings who have no kingdom as yet, meaning they didn't exist in John's day, but receive power one hour with the beast. These are 10 nations with 10 leaders that in Daniel are already there in existence, that the Antichrist gives them authority in one hour to link with him and join his unit and his nation. Now, here's my point. 
There are not, and I know people say, what about OPEC, what about this, what about the Gulf, what about that, what about the EU? Everybody, well, Brother Perry, I believe the Ten Kings are already here. I believe it's the EU. Really? Do you know how many nations are presently in the EU? Now, maybe they're all going to quit and end up with ten. Who knows? But can I tell you this? There's too many toes on that foot if you put the EU on that image. And in Daniel 2, the legs of that image are all, everything's metallic, gold, silver, brass, and iron. Iron is Rome. Rome split between east and west, right? Rome, Italy, Constantinople, which means if you got ten toes, you can't have them all on one foot. <laughs> one leg is east and one leg is west, and you got five from the east and you got five from the west, and that's how precise God is when he puts something together. That's how precise he is. All right. If we were in the sixth seal, those ten kings should already be out there and we should recognize who they are and they should be a unit of ten. They're not there yet. Can't be in the, so there, therefore, really, we can't, even, we can't be in the tribulation yet. Are we in tribulation? Sure, look at the entire world. It's in travail. Are we in the great tribulation? Not at this point. Secondly, here's a big one. Folks, if we were in the tribulation, there should be a treaty signed. When they signed the Oslo Agreement, I had three prophecy friends of mine. I said, don't do it. Don't do it. Oh, this is it. Oh, God, this is the agreement of the Antichrist. Uh, they're signing an agreement with the Palestinians. And it's a seven, it's going to be, it's, well, first of all, I said, you got a problem with it. There's not even a seven years mentioned in the whole treaty. That's problem one. Problem number two, it says that you have to sign a covenant with many and not just Israel and the PLO, it has to be many surrounding nations in agreement with it that's on the signature. And I went on and on. Well, Oslo was in the 90s under Clinton. Hello, somebody. 20 years has passed. And of course, if the seven year tribulation was in there somewhere, Jesus forgot to come back. Where are you? Right? So my point is this. In Daniel 9, 27, the 70 weeks of prophecy that are mentioned in Daniel no, let, let, okay, let, let, let me say, I'm, oh, I made some pretty cool notes here. Let me go to these notes. Maybe this will help. Seven years, three and a half, three and a half. Here we go. The first half, beginning of it, a treaty is signed. In the middle, last half, the treaty's broken. First half, 42 months, the Jews have protection with the seal of God that the Antichrist cannot touch them. Mid-trib to the end, the Jews are all fleeing because their protection has been lifted. First half, 1,260 days, two witnesses minister and nobody can touch them. The Antichrist is restrained from taking them out. I preached this last night. Middle half to the end, Antichrist kills the two witnesses and then goes to Jerusalem and rules from there to control the city. It's very clear that there has to be seven years connected to this somewhere, and it all begins with the signing of an agreement. There has not been at this point, and there's rumors, there's rumors flying around out there, but there has not been to this point, this major, it, this look, this treaty is so huge that it determines everything in Bible prophecy at the end time. You can now see and hear the 10 unedited prophetic messages preached live at the recent International Prophetic Summit. Thousands of people attended and enjoyed four of America's premier prophetic teachers, Perry Stone, Jonathan Kahn, Donald Perkins, and Bill Cloud. Perry delivers four profound messages regarding the end times. In the message, The Third Temple and How It Will Impact the World, Perry explores the coming of a third temple in Jerusalem, detailing when the building process will begin and the one man who will be the pivotal key in fulfilling the biblical predictions of a tribulation temple. In the message, Are We Now in the Tribulation? Perry gives a fascinating expose detailing things which must occur in order to signal the beginning of the Great Tribulation. In the late 1800s, a New York journalist reported on a series of dreams, revealing the condition of America at the time of the end, including angry mobs roaming the cities, trouble south of the border, and a government that would abuse the Constitution. Hear more about this in Perry's third message, Approaching the End of the Age, from now until 2023, as Perry also explains how the church has miscalculated the time of the end by dating prophetic events from the birth of Christ instead of His crucifixion. 
Perry's fourth message, How Israel and the Jews Prove God Exists, is said by many to be the most prophetic message they have heard in years. This conference set also includes six other powerful prophetic messages such as The Second Coming of Christ in Armageddon by Donald Perkins, The Secret of the Third Day by Bill Cloud, The Coming and Shaking by Bill Cloud, and The Strange and New Harbingers That Are God's Handwriting on America's Wall by Jonathan Kahn. Order this conference on 10 audio CDs for a donation of just $65 or more. For your donation of $110 or more, you will receive 10 DVDs, which include the visuals that were presented to the audience who attended the conference. Order now by calling toll-free 1-888-21-BREAD. That's 1-888-212-7323. Or order online at perrystone.org. You may also write to Perry Stone Ministries, P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37320, and request the CDs or DVDs. When ordering CDs, ask for offer number 15PS-CD. For DVDs, ask for offer number 15PS-DVD. Shipping and handling are included. This offer with such timely information is a must for every viewer of Manifest. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Well, I hope you enjoyed the excerpt from the International Prophetic Summit. The CDs and DVDs are extremely powerful. We had over 3,600 people show up to this conference from around the United States. And you're only getting an excerpt, so please get the entire message that's available for a very, very limited time. I believe you need to hear the times that we're in, what to do, and what's about to happen according to Scripture and according to the prophetic word of the Holy Spirit. A couple places we're coming to very shortly. We'll be at Monroe, Louisiana on Friday, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, July the 10th through the 12th. That's Pastor Shane Warren's church. That's a great conference we're going to have there. Everybody from the Louisville, Kentucky area and from Kentucky show up on the Thursday July 16th all the way through July 19th, which is a Sunday evening, Belltown Road, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Evangel World Prayer Center for one of our conferences there. And of course, we've come, we're coming to Willis, Texas. We're doing a, a spiritual warfare conference at Abba's House in the month of August. We're going to be coming to a lot of different places, Huntington, West Virginia, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Cartersville, Georgia, Gainesville. We're coming to a conference in Free Chapel Worship Center in October at Gainesville, Georgia, Jensen Franklin's Church, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning. And I just want you to go to our website at perrystone.org and look up the itinerary for our our conferences and for our other events. Now, if you're not a partner of our ministry, we have a very special partners uh, uh, website that you can be a part of, or you can receive a message each month on CD called Monthly Manna. So if you'd like more information about that, please contact our office and uh, Donna Garland, our partners director, will be able to help you and send the information you're asking. God bless you till next week. Make this your year to feel the history. Taste the culture, experience the antiquity, walk where the modern touches the ancient. Sign up now to join Perry Stone November 23rd through December 2nd for an unforgettable tour of Israel. For more information, visit perrystone.org or call 1-888-321-3629. Make this your year for a trip of a lifetime.